everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Security Insights, where security best practices meets the real-world workplace. My name is Chris Gettle. I'm Ivanti's Vice President of Product Management for our Risk and Remediation Solutions. And joining me once again is Robert Waters from our Product Marketing Group. Robert, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be back once again. And I'm going to kick off today's topic, which is as everyone I think knows, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're recording this in October. And what sort of cybersecurity podcast would we be if we didn't do a Cybersecurity Awareness Month episode? So in an honor of the, the holiday, air quotes, we asked a group of our colleagues at Avanti to send in their best cybersecurity tips for us to share with our audience. So that's what we'll be doing here today. We're going to play some of these tips for everyone, and then you and I will kind of break them down and, and discuss. So our first tip comes from Sabojit Roy, who is a staff product manager here at Avanti, and it focuses on the concept of security champions. Establish security champions within each department who can advocate for best practices and act as liaisons between teams and security professionals. It will help weave a culture of security throughout the organization, eventually making it second nature to factor security into any decisions that you make. So today I'm going to talk about two scenarios on how security champions can make a difference across different teams. For example, the development teams. Our security champions and development teams ensure secure coding practices are followed and regularly collaborates with security team to address vulnerabilities during the development lifecycle. They promote security tools like the static and dynamic code analysis and ensure security reviews are part of every sprint. The second scenario, the finance department. A security champion in finance work closely with security to prevent phishing scams and enforce MFA on all financial systems. They educate colleagues about common fraud schemes and enforce secure financial transaction practices. That's all from my end. Stay safe, stay secure, and thanks for watching. Well, thanks to Sabojit for that tip. And you know what, what comes to mind for me there is, yeah, you absolutely need these security champions, these security-minded people installed throughout an organization because you know, cyber attackers, they're not going to go after your cybersecurity team, those cybersecurity experts. As a matter of fact, they're going to do the complete opposite and they're going to look for the easiest targets they can find, which is usually someone outside of working in cybersecurity every day. You know, people in accounting, people in marketing like myself. Right. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, no, so Hojit makes a couple of very good points throughout uh, his, his tip making security a cultural shift. I mean, it, it is something that we all face when the organization is under attack. That could be a phishing scam targeting end users through their phone, which we're going to talk about later today. It could be a phone scam. It could be a deep fake. It could be any number of things that are targeting our end users. The attachments that they get that look like they're job related. Threat actors are very crafty about how they do this. So Making sure that we've got that understanding, making sure that we've got good training across our entire organization. But suppose it's point of having secure, more security-minded people be embedded and be champions with each group is is ideal. Um, you know, one of the reasons that uh, uh, you know I uh, hired suppose it, he's a fairly new PM to our team. He actually had a very strong cybersecurity background. I wanted a couple of product managers within my team who have a, a more solid domain knowledge in that. Within our development organization, we embed security practitioners within our engineering groups as kind of a pod. Within the Avanti organization, we've got a security council. That security council is made up of our CISO, deputy CISO, and some of our security team, but also people from each department. HR is there, legal, privacy, um, sales even. There, there's members of each of our teams who are involved in the culture of being more security minded. That gives you an overall organization that focuses around security first and helps to educate each of their departments to make sure that we're stay safer as a company. Absolutely. Yeah. Security culture from top to bottom is key. And and thanks again to Sabojit for that clip. I can, I can validate what you said. He's definitely got a security background and that security knowledge. And I've seen it exhibited in some chats and some other spaces. So that's always good to have. He's, I guess, one of the security champions here at Avanti. Yep. Moving onward, the next tip we have was submitted by lead sales engineer, Tim Cox. And it's all about the importance of risk-based prioritization. 
forget the numbers and focus on the risk. Yes, you heard correctly, forget the numbers and focus on the risk. By shifting to a risk-based prioritization methodology, you can make it easier to respond to high-risk applications and vulnerabilities that expose your business to risk. As an example, we're talking patch management here, focusing on the numbers directly, you may be missing a thousand patches, a massive task given the wrong tool set, but given the correct tools, you can focus and quicker remediate those vulnerabilities that cause the most damage. The damage that ransomware, remote code, privilege escalation, and denial of service exploits can have on your business. By focusing on the risk factors, such as risk rating, CVE, and CVSS scoring, to name a few, you close those specific open doors quicker, securing your business. Focus where it matters most. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. So. Tim was clearly a man after our own hearts here because he hit close to home on the the products and the technologies and the issues that we focus on every day. So I'll let you speak first here, Chris, because I know this is your real area of activity. Yeah. So speaking of uh, champions, we actually uh, have uh, champions from each of our different uh, uh, field teams. And Tim is actually one of our cybersecurity champions for the products that we uh, push uh, through uh, my team, the his focus is a, a very good one. I've talked to a lot of organizations who are still trying to just keep up with the massive volume of updates and vulnerabilities that are out there. If you're in that role within your organization, dealing with patching or vulnerability remediation in general, you know that it's just a continuous street. You get really close to compliance, and then the next day, more more updates come out, more vulnerabilities are identified, more things need to be resolved. It's a never ending treadmill that we're running on. Some of our customers who are really trying to push the envelope and focus on a different way of doing things are doing exactly what Tim described. Um, I, I talked to one of our banking customers who they have two different ways of looking at things. They've got the, you know, when we're, when we're talking the numbers game, here's how we're doing against all updates. And then they have a different way of filtering that's looking at the ones that are exposing us to risk. So CVSS, vendor severity, they're a point in time static representation of that vulnerability alone. If Auntie's risk-based vulnerability and patch solutions have that uh, a variety of uh, pieces of metadata in there to, to help us understand what's actively being targeted. What are the things that threat actors are trending, uh, you know, targeting? What's tied to ransomware? You saw that in a couple of uh, the points that Tim made. With that understanding, we can shift our focus over to prioritizing more risky items first. And organizations that are doing that actually see themselves um, up at compliance continuously by shifting that focus. They can focus in on a, a number of items that are easy to manage and make sure that they're continuously reducing that real world risk versus trying to solve every problem out there, which no, nobody has time to do everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Great points. And this is really playing into what we're seeing as one of the biggest trends in the market from vendors and from analysts right now, which is exposure management. Right. And exposure management came from the realization that, you know, we're, we're getting all these CVs. We have like 30,000 plus new CVEs every year. And that's just a microcosm of the greater exposure universe where there's misconfigurations and application security issues, all that can't possibly fix them all, but it's historically been difficult to figure out which ones you do need to fix. So you end up going after every CVSS critical and things are seemingly starting to shift where, you know, everyone's coming to the realization that's, that's not going to be a tenable model moving forward. And we need to get to a point where we're focusing on that risk, focusing on remediating strategically, if you will, those select right. exposures that really do present risk to the organization and the rest you can uh, deal with later. So thanks again to Tim for that submission. Tip number three coming up next is from cybersecurity engineer, Joshua Randall. And Joshua's tip has to do with the importance of unique passwords. Today, I'm talking about unique passwords. I know everyone has heard this before and that's okay. Today, I'm going to try to give you a little bit more information about why it is important. We're going to be talking about how this defends against credential stuffing attacks. 
Now, these attacks are when one account on one company gets leaked in a data breach and attackers can use that to try to log into other accounts all over the internet until they get a match. This is all automated. They don't have to do a thing until it dings and says, hey, we got one, okay? So to fix this, what we need to do is make sure every account has a unique password. And I'm not talking about the same password with just one digit changes, like when that number just goes up by one for each account. You know who you are, let's not do that. Let's get a truly unique password. But when you have hundreds of accounts like I do, it's impossible to remember them all for each and every account. So get a password manager. Password managers, keep them all secure and you can access them on all of your devices whenever you need them. Great way to keep secure, have you those unique passwords. And don't forget to enable multi-factor authentication wherever you can. But that's a topic for another time. Thanks, Joshua. Great tip. You know, like you said, we've heard it a million times, but you need to hear it a million and one because just that important. And I'll admit, I am a, a reformed password <laughs> abuser. I used to have one password for everything. And I thought, well, because it's, it's kind of a quirky password and no one would ever really just guess it on their own that I was safe. So I used it far and wide. And as I honed my cybersecurity knowledge, I realized, wow, that is going to get me in trouble one day. And so I have come around, I am a password manager, uh, you know, evangelist at this point. I, you know, if you've listened to any past episodes, I think I, I sneak in a reference just about every time we come anywhere close to touching on the topic of password. Yep. So, I mean, great tip. I don't have much more to add. Chris, how about you? But Joshua's tip is a great one. Um, I think too many people underestimate the dangers of having the same password for everything. If you use that password for Amazon, your email address and that password, Amazon's probably not the company who's going to lose that on you. You know, it's going to be the small rinky dink uh, e boutique uh, website that you use the same username and password for that's going to get compromised. But threat actors know that human behavior is the same the world over. They're going to take that smaller company that they targeted, they're going to use that combination in all the places you'd expect it, Amazon and uh, basically all the big names that you would be logging into. And with that, they will absolutely get into your other accounts, not by compromising Amazon, but by compromising some little company that you're using the same password for. So Joshua's point is a very good one. Now, if you're not comfortable with a password manager, there's uh, more rudimentary ways that are still better than using the same password everywhere. Get a, a little, you know, uh, a notebook to to write these things in. Um, even, you know, with your family, have a set of accounts that everybody's using. Your Netflix, your uh, Prime, you know, all the different things that everybody in the family may need to get into. Your Domino's password, right? All these things you could just have that written down so that you've got a common place where uh, your family can use the same uh, information, but make it more secure. Um, so there's ways to do this with the password manager like Joshua recommended. I definitely recommend that, but there are other ways to do that. Biometric and MFA wherever possible. Um, most of our mobile apps now are very good about giving us that type of solution. Use the biometric, have that be your login. That way you only have to use that complex, unique password once in a while when that application updates and we have to reset it. So there's a lot of ways to do this to minimize your overall impact and make that experience better, but make sure that you've got secure passwords behind that because threat actors are very good at manipulating us into getting access to that information. Absolutely. And you're right. The biometrics, I mean, layer that on top of your passwords. The password is just the first line of defense. You want to stack your multi-factor authentications on top of that, make things even more difficult for a, a would-be attacker, if you will. Moving on now to our next tip. This next one here was submitted by senior security analyst Daniel Gressier, and it encourages people to adopt a zero trust mindset. My tip for Cybersecurity Awareness Month is to adopt a zero trust mindset. Uh, it's my guiding principle and how I approach everything I do. Uh, to use a common scenario, for example, imagine you've received an email asking for something you typically deliver, but you don't recognize who sent it. Instead of just replying to the email with the requested information, 
you can apply a zero trust mindset and fill in the blanks. Don't know the sender? Look around for their email address, their email domain, or even just their name, and previous meetings, email chains, that type of thing. Do you typically expect these types of emails or reply to these types of emails? If not, why is it coming to you now? Can you confirm this is a required expectation of your role or something out of the ordinary? Essentially, Zero Trust to me is taking everything in context you aren't sure about and trying to fill in the blanks to assess whether something can be trusted or not. Brilliant. Thanks to Daniel for that tip. And, you know, I think it can really be summed up as, as trust your gut. So if you ever get an email that sets off alarm bells in your head, 99% chance that it is a phishing attempt or it's some or other sort of, you know, scandalous attempt to, to get your information. It's, it's likely not legitimate. And we see this all the time. I mean, I, it's one thing when I get the emails from, you know, somebody overseas who needs me to help them get their inheritance that was in a U.S. bank and it's a hundred million dollars and I get $10 million just for co-signing on it. Okay. Obviously a scam, but these scams are getting much more sophisticated where I'll get emails now from, you know, from my bank, or at least it looks like my bank. And my inclination is, yeah, I'm going to click on this. What's going on here? But you can usually tell if you know what to look for, if you check that email address, you know, it's off by one letter. Or if you hover over the, the link and you see, well, this doesn't go to, you know, chase.com. This goes somewhere else entirely. You know, it's, it's good to trust your gut, but also to have the knowledge of what to look for. When your gut's telling you something wrong, how can you validate that? Yes, in fact, this is a problem and I shouldn't put that. Yeah, I think uh, Daniel's right. By the way, I think he wins uh, best accent out of our lineup today <laughs> and uh, also best tattoos. Um, but uh, overall, is uh, his points are very good. Adopting a slight case of paranoia is ideal in today's world. Uh, I'm not saying like, uh, you know, get a tin hat and, uh, you know, go off the grid and uh, start stockpiling, but make sure that you do question everything. You know, your, your typical vendors, your mobile vendor, your cable provider, Microsoft, Apple, these are not companies that are going to call you directly and tell you, hey, you've got a problem. We should sit down and talk about this. Give me your password real quick and I'm going to help you through it. They don't have the time and the resources to do that. Those are common scams that we run into on a regular basis that people get tricked up by because they're caught in the moment and they just panic and they're like, oh, oh God, I don't even know I had this problem. Help me fix it. Well, that's the first thing you should be questioning is why are they reaching out to me? Why are they asking me to do something and triggering a response where I stop thinking clearly and just focus on the problem? I actually had a recent experience, one that could have easily been a phishing attempt, but it actually turned out to be benign. But the fact that I questioned it was a good thing because it could have gone either way. Um, a former healthcare provider, one that I had not uh, done any uh, business with for over 10 years, started uh, to reach out to me via, via phone and I got a voicemail telling me that I had bills overdue and that they were going to send it over to a claims department. This is a perfect type of scam. It triggers us at an immediate risk. My credit score could be at risk because of something that I'm not even aware of. But that should be the first warning bell. So I listened to that message. I got the information from it, the phone number they told me to call, the, the company that they said it was from. I did not contact them through that information. I went completely separately and I looked that company up by myself. I cross-validated that information and I called that company directly. And I'm like, okay, help me out with this. I'm getting some information. I'm questioning it because I don't believe I've actually done business through your hospitals in over 10 years. This is back where I used to live. I haven't lived there in a long time. Well, we got through the whole process and I really feel sorry for the woman because I was grilling her hard. Um, but at the end of it, we found out it was a bug in their software that made something trigger on my account, which hadn't been used in a long time, but was still on record there. But in that case, it could have very easily been a scam. So having that level of paranoia, making sure that you're double checking anything against a reference that didn't come from the person who's trying to engage you, those types of things help you in, in uh, 
making sure that you're not being duped into giving up information. That's what Daniel means when he says, adopt a zero trust mindset. Um, listen, but uh, you know, validate through other sources before taking any action and never give up any type of password information or anything like that. They should never ask you for that type of information. They may have to validate you know, certain information about you, but if they call you and get you on the phone directly, get information from them and be like, let me call you back through a different way. And if I can validate that, yes, we'll talk more. But if they call you and try to get your social security number or personal identification information, those types of things to validate you, make sure you reach out to them through a trusted source before giving any information up. Well put. Trust mm -hmm. but verify as they yes. say. Yes. And, and he used the term urgency. You know, if someone's trying to create a sense of urgency in an email, that's usually a trigger that something is wrong. And, and think about it. How many times have you gotten a legitimate email that's urgent? That's really not the nature of email. It's asynchronous communication. So right. don't, don't fall for the urgency. They're trying to get you ramped up, get your heart rate going, and then to jump on something, it's usually a trick. With that, last but not least, tip five comes from principal field CTO, Bruce Payne, and it's directed at users of mobile devices, which I think is everyone these days. So let's take a listen. Remember to be extra vigilant when clicking on links from your mobile device. Attackers are relying on the smaller screen size of the mobile phone to hide nefarious URLs by making them super long and really hard to distinguish as illegitimate. Remember, any message or email designed to trigger an immediate response is and should be treated as suspect. A mobile threat defense solution can do real-time phishing analysis and protection to block these URLs wherever they come from on the device. Security teams can then not only see the phishing attempts centrally, but can start to spot patterns to see which users, typically your execs, are being targeted. Thanks to Bruce for that tip. And it's almost like he was listening to the conversation we just had right. about, you know, looking out for links and looking out for someone trying to create a sense of immediacy. But he's focusing really on that mobile device use case. And he also gives us a solution to the problem, which is when all else fails, if you do click the link, there are technologies out there, such as mobile threat defense that he mentioned, that can be used to mitigate some of the damage. Absolutely. So it, all of us have phones, cell phones now. They are a target, whether it's the SMS texting, the email, browser links, QR codes. All of those are different ways that threat actors can try to target us. Each of those are things that could be used against us. So again, you, you heard uh, a few of those key things. If it creates a sense of urgency, question it. If it uh, doesn't seem like something you would have done and, uh, you know, so wait a second, did you uh, order $900 worth of uh, furniture from this department store in New York? No, I live in Minnesota. Why the hell would I would have done that? <laughs> um, those are the types of things that they do. They make you think that, uh, you know, panic quick, do something, give information, try to figure this out. That's the point where we have to stop and think, just like we talked about with uh, Daniel uh, before, but uh, Bruce's point of there are deterrents for these types of things as well, mobile threat being one of them. These technologies are here to help protect us. That mobile device, the top threats on that are trying to steal your identity through any means that they can. So whether that's the uh, SMS text, um, I'm pretty sure I just got another uh, phishing text this morning uh, from you know some woman who's like, oh, would you like to supplement your income with additional income? Here's how you know. Tell me this, and I will help you get set up. Um, yeah, that th that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to target somebody and say, hey, do you want to get to a better place in life? I can help you with that. Right? They're trying to tap into those nerves where we have an urgency to want to change something about our situation or prevent disaster. Um, so watch for those but also use technologies on your device to make sure to protect yourself. We talked about MFA biometrics and other types of pieces like that. That goes right along with what, uh, what Bruce was talking about here, mobile threat defense being yet another layer of protection we can do on that. Depending on your mobile provider, you can uh, um, also get additional security features like eSIM protection and other things like that. Lock down your SIM card. Yes, it makes it so you've got one more code to type in when you boot up your phone, but it also protects you against another type of overall attack. 
hey, that side-loaded app that your friend got, that uh, all it does is require you to jailbreak your phone, <laughs> rethink that. It's going to basically remove all protections from your phone when you do that and put it into a state where it's very easy to target. And probably that app, which is free if you jailbreak your phone and sideload it, probably comes with something not so great embedded in it. So just making good choices and ensuring that we're using the technologies and protections built into our devices or that we could supplement our devices with goes a long way to ensure that we're going to stay safe. 100%. And thanks again to Bruce for that tip. And thanks again to everyone who submitted a tip. And if you're listening to this in October, happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. If it's November, December, or beyond, happy belated Cybersecurity Awareness Month. But remember, cybersecurity awareness is key all year round. That's why we do this podcast, really. And with that note, Chris, let's bring it home. Thanks, Robert. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of Security Insights. As always, feel free to share this episode if you liked what you heard. We will be back next month with an all new cybersecurity topic. Be sure to subscribe and come back next time. Until then, stay safe.